two young guys, young guns of China. Odyssey Linguagua has been around for quite some time now and has had decent success. Pink, one of these young aspiring players, undead player from China, today stepping into the ring has... Uh, quite the chance to make a name for himself, to prove himself today. It's not going to be easy, you know. Especially in this group. Am I right? But we'll see how he does. We'll see how the two will be able to do against each other and against the legends. And we're about to hop into our first game already. Let's go. This is best of three, of course, in the group stage. Yesterday, 1-2-0 and Lin, the two big favorites, did make it through quite clearly. 15 Sway had a decent showing for PCG. It was a bit more difficult. We'll see how this goes here now. 100 versus Orc, our first matchup of the day. Linguagua is playing Farsia at Hunters. As most orcs are doing at the moment. Yesterday I gave a bit of a prediction. And I really do feel this way. I feel like undeads are figuring out Farsia headhunters more and more. And where Farsia headhunters is very strong in the early and mid game, I think it is much, much weaker than Blade Master in the late game. So I expect the top orcs soon to be switching back to Blade Master. I think the main reason why they're not doing it now is because they're not so used to it anymore. And high level Blade Master play takes a lot of practice. And I think a lot of players are just simply a bit out of practice at the moment with that style. Attack. And of course, Farseer is, you know, something new, something fresh, something fun. And something that's a lot easier to play than the Blade Master triple hero style. But uh, yeah, anyways, that's, I guess, beside the point. Pretty passive early game so far. Both just creeping for now. Normally we see the Farsia player harassing um, fairly quickly. Creep level 2 maybe. And then try to slow down the DK. But it can also just be as efficient or more efficient to just go creeping yourself. Because you're going to have a lot of headhunters out quite quickly. And with those headhunters you can creep very efficiently. Little fun fact by the way. Something that not all players know is uh, headhunters actually have pretty much the same DPS as archers. But of course they're a lot more survivable. Oh, Pink taking a lot of damage here, creeping. I feel like the creep route for him was perhaps not the best. Ooh, chain lightning. Quite dangerous, forcing him to TP out. Found a replenishment potion, which is the perfect item right now. One of my favorite items. Replenishment Potion. Um, yeah, Pink went for the orange outside the main right away for the first creep camp. I feel like that's not the best creep route. I think the best thing you can do is go to the middle, go for the green camp turtle, and then go back to your main, and then creep around your main to level 3. Because level 3 is obviously a big milestone. Big difference maker. And on a little side note, by the way, unfortunately, we are not allowed into the lobbies in this tournament, so we're not allowed to observe ourselves. We are given a clean feed to cover this tournament, so that's why, you know, we don't have our own overlay, and uh, I don't have my own camera control. This is what the Chinese production is giving us. It's a bit bare bones, I know, but, you know, um, we can still enjoy these games, I hope. Very standard play out of the two so far. It's the Dark Ranger second, which is the norm nowadays. Pink gonna try to creep her up. Solo creeping on her can be really good, in fact. You wanna get that level 3 for the level 2 Black Arrow as quickly as you can. Dark Ranger, super strong. Oh, Farseer, I think he telestaffed across the map. Oh yeah, he did! What a nice play! He sent an illusion into the main base and then used the telestaff to get in. And there's no TP anymore on Pink. He kills an Acolyte. Cancels a ziggurat. Oh my god, this is so much damage already. That is going to put him so economically behind. And it's really important in this matchup to especially not fall behind early, but to try to never fall behind at all. Because once you fall behind, the orc can easily go for a tiny Great Hall expansion on tier 3. 
and can secure themselves a very easy win condition. Ooh, that's a rough start for Pink. I'm not sure what the second hero is. We've mostly seen uh, Shadow Hunter lately, but TC second is also a possibility. Lingwagwa was, however, very busy with his harass, so I think he crept nothing so far. Well, maybe he crept the one orange camp outside his main. I guess that's possible. A bit of skelly harass isn't really gonna lead to much here. It's dealt with easily with the burrows. And it is the TC! Alrighty. Um, the more popular choice recently seems to have been Shadow, as I said. But I think, honestly, the TC is better. I feel like if you don't play TC second, the Torn Chieftain's impact is just gonna be too low. Because, of course, if you don't play him second, you play him third. And I think if you play him third, he's just too low level. Normally, he's gonna be only level two at most by the first... by the time the first big fight rolls around. And the first big fight at around 50 supply is gonna be crucial. Of course, the Shadow Hunter is gonna be a bit underleveled as well if you swap out those hero positions. I think that Shadowna does better with low level. Just level 1 Shadow with Hex is good already. But the TC really needs level 3 to be very impactful. And actually level 4 is also a big level up for the TC. Boosting up the whole army. Of course it comes at a cost. And that is healing. If you don't play Shadowhunter second, you're going to be either having no healing in the first big fight. Or only very little healing with level 1 heal wave. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit scary, but I still think the TC shapes up better, in my opinion. That might mean that Lingwagwa may need a heal scroll to compensate for that healing, but uh, that's, of course, also pretty expensive. Rather, right now, seems like he wants to invest into a tiny Great Hall. He sends the peons over already. 600 gold is how much he needs for the tiny. And yeah, that's the easy peasy win condition. If you're playing a normal game and the undead has not fallen behind, the undead will be level 3 by the time the tiny great hall comes down. And then it can be a suicide move to go for the tiny because you just invested 600 gold into that tiny great hall and then the undead shows up with like 6 level 2 skeletons. But here everything is a bit off for pink. He took damage in the main, he lost gold. He lost ziggurats, he lost time creeping, and he's not level 3 Dark Ranger yet, and his army is just simply uh, not that threatening yet. So a good game by Linguagua. Um, nothing too complicated yet, but you know, he exec executed it well. Linguagua trying to come in for the creepjack, that TC was a bit mispositioned, <laughs> couldn't quite reach with the speed scroll, but now he does. Stomp connects. It's the powerful level 2 stomp, and the Hex follow-up comes in, so the DK is disabled. Nicely done by Linguagua, and... I think, uh, finally gets level 3 on the Dark Ranger, but it seems like his army size isn't just where it needs to be. That is one of the big differences, or difficulties, I should say, for Anad in this matchup. If you fall behind, you get punished super hard with that tiny Great Hall. And the hero focus is so strong. Stomp Hex, Stomp Hex, over and over. Normally you need an invul potion for that, but Pink wasn't in position, he didn't have enough gold because he suffered so much damage, he didn't have an invul, he also didn't have a TP anymore to perhaps save his heroes. You can try to go destroyers, at least one, to counteract Hex, but destroyers are kind of useless against this army really. Um, so normally what you want to have rather is TP and invul potion to survive this hero focus. Because the Orc heroes will run out of mana, and the way the Undead wins this matchup, usually in the late game, against Farsia Headhunters, is by out-sustaining the Orc. Keep on kiting, keep on saving your units and heroes, and win the mana battle with statues over time. And make use of your strong heroes. But here for Pink, everything was a bit off. To the untrained eye, this game can look... Uh, a little daunting. As if there wasn't much that Pink was able to do. But it's just the nature of the matchup. You just need to make sure you don't fall behind. And then things can look very different. We saw that yesterday, for example, by 120 versus Lin. Where 120 completely destroyed Lin. Lin didn't have necessarily the best day there. And also Happy has shown that plenty of times in the past. 
Early game efficiency and creep routes are also very important. You need to make sure you're creeping well, you get the level ups nicely, and uh, you don't take too much damage, you get the Dark Ranger in time, and you're not forced, forced to TP out too easily. This was all just, uh, you know, things not coming together too well, and I think yeah, Pink needs to work a bit more on his detailed early game, especially in the in the future. He needs to know better where he has to be and what he can do. <clears throat> I mentioned it earlier, the creep route here really wasn't that great. There seems to be a much better one. And now Pink is far behind. Very, very far behind. Lingwagwa has so much gold through this expansion, he's even got a shredder, so he's got infinite lumber soon as well. He's got strong hero levels. If the Shadow Hunter gets level 3, this is basically over. There shouldn't really be a way for him to win anymore, but... Uh, Lingwagwa also seems to have been a bit... A little bit greedy here. 2,000 gold. Honestly, I think he shouldn't even defend this expansion. Just keep creeping the rest of the map and go for a new tiny great hall later. Yeah, I think that's what he's doing. I think that's smart. There's no need really to hold on to this expo. It already paid off nicely. You can just let it go. Keep on leveling. If you're getting pushed into the main, then you can come back to defend, but Linguara can just creep up the remaining camps and then just go for a new tiny great hall. He does have the gold pretty easily. And that is Shadow Hunter level 3. Very nice. Also, the red camp item was amazing. Finding the Legion Doomhorn there is outstanding. Very high movement speed now on the orc side, and even more passive HP region over time. He's at the marketplace, maybe. Shopping for some more items there as well. And now we're gonna have the big brawl. 60 supply for the orc. If Pink smashes this fight, he still has a chance. But it's gonna be hard to do. We see that the destroyer with ensnare plus focus fire it just goes down so fast. Many of the top undeads out there aren't even playing destroyers anymore nowadays in this matchup. And uh, you saw the reason why right there. Once you take out all the raiders, then you can go into destroyers late into the fight, but at the beginning, usually they just get destroyed, ironically. And Pink is finding a few kills, but oh my lordy, look at that stomp. Linguagua, honestly, doesn't have to try hard in this fight. He's uh, got enough of a lead that he can just A-click in here. Which reminds me of Yaws's quote back then, where he said, The only games... No, wait, how did it go again? The, are under the only games that you win with Micro are the games you weren't supposed to win anyways. That's not exactly the quote, but it was something like that. Where he basically said, if you play right, you shouldn't need Micro to win. That's kind of the essence. Which, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm, I don't really agree with. Because, uh, especially if you're undead, there's not many strategies where you can just play without micro. Well, I guess, you know, with Cryptlord expansion, with Google Expo into Gargs, you don't need much micro. But, for the most part, you have to try to kite pretty effectively. And Pink did manage to kite back to the main and survive. But, as I oftentimes like to say, there's a big difference between surviving and winning. Linguagua still with a bit of a bang left can afford another tiny, and it seems like that is the plan. Hero levels also on pink, not looking too bad. He's got 4 3 3. That is what you want to see in this kind of late game. Maybe. 5, 4, 3 uh, would be more appropriate at this time. Are under but yeah, he's just very far behind. Ever since that early game. I think this this might be the matchup where it's most important to not fall behind in Undead versus Orc. Mainly because of the nature of Tiny Great Hall. Alright, but Pink... He's gonna try one last stand. He brings in the ghouls. He's got a mana potion throw the beast. But he's down by like 15 supply or something like that. 
and also by a bit of uh, hero levels. What if we more destroyers? I've sometimes wondered, wouldn't be a few support uh, necromancers, wouldn't they be good in this kind of army, like in the super late game? We never really see them. Normally Banshees are good against Orc, but against this army, not so much. More against Blade Master armies, Banshees are very good. And the Storms are glorious. Time and time again, Ghouls taken out quickly. Fiends have quite some damage here with the Throw of the Beast, but perhaps not enough. TC... Oh! Dropping very low as well. Might be going down with some more nukes. Heal wave on cooldown. TC, low HP, but the heal war in the back also healing him up nicely. And now he is almost level 5. The Fasia is already level 5. We have the Invis Wolves now, which are super strong against fiends. Pink feels the need to morph more destroyers, which are good against the wolves. But the problem is they get hard countered by the rest of the orc army. Again, I keep referencing Happy. I think many of you remember his grand final match against Focus, where he played a really good series and uh, I think showed the way to go in this matchup. And yeah, Happy basically never went destroyers, only very, very late when there were no raiders anymore and the arms were very small. But the ledge goes down, and I think that's it. To finish the thought, what Happy used to do is just click down the wolves over and over, don't morph destroyers, and then keep on kiting, of course, and. Uh, win over time and don't fall behind that is the most important thing i hope you caught it i only mentioned it like six times but yeah if you fall behind things get rough and that is the one o lead for linguagua linguagua this time around has honestly gotten a pretty good draw neo and i we've been memeing in the past how <laughs> it seems like linguagua always lands in the group of death. But this time it's looking much better. Honestly, this time, he's got the easiest group. By... by far, even, I would say. Yesterday in Group A, the two big favorites, 1-0 to zero and Lin, made it through. And yeah, 1-0 uh, to zero and Lin, of course, both world-class players in Group B. Moon, also a super scary player. Focus has been looking really good lately as well. But normally isn't quite on the same level as Lin and 120, which is why I say that Group B seems to be the easiest group from Linguagua's perspective. Group C we're gonna have tomorrow where our boy Foggy is gonna be representing the Western region. And uh, this is also a very tough group. Colorful, Foggy and Sock in the same group. And honestly, Kaho has shown some pretty impressive performances as well in the past. He's another young player, promising. Young talent from China. And then Group D. Woo! Group D on Saturday is going to be juicy. It's going to be Ted's big return into one of the first big tournaments he's played in in a long, long time. And Lawlight and Chimiko and Fly. All in the same group. This is a this is a crazy group. Man. This is going to be a lot of fun on Saturday. We're going to have the playoffs on Sunday. And on Monday. Continuing on Monday uh, for the top four and the decision and the crowning of our champion. Big prize pool, by the way, for this tournament. $17,000 almost, total prize money, and more than 6000 for first place, so quite a bit to play for. Smile Cup 1, a few months ago, went to Fly. Smile Cup 2 went to Len, and uh, we'll see if the Orc dominance continues. If Focus now wins this one, that will be the Horde quite happy. Thank you, by the way, Ragiha Dream with the two month resub says, Hey guys, thank you, Mikey PX, for gifting a sub to my Aces. Thank you, KMS3D with a 55 month resub. Oh my god, it says, Go, 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 Remo. Fake Face Chan with a 19 month says, For the Horde. And Pui with a 10 month resub says, Hi. Thank you very much. My homies. All right. Seems like we are off to the races here, wasting no time getting ready for map two. Ooh. Bit of a spike on the stream. Baby, don't leave me. Baby, don't leave me. No more. 
Aquiles. Kind of surprised that Linguagua didn't veto this map. I feel like this is a pretty damn good undead map. I think in this matchup, both with this uh, hero setup as well with a Blade Master, I think it's the Orc who rather wants to go late game, who rather wants to creep a lot, who rather would like to be high level across the board. And on Echo Isles, there's very few creeps. So it's going to be quite hard to reach those levels. And Linguagra shifting gears now. He was playing very passively on Tidehunters, just creeping. But here now, looking for harass instantly. A player's forces are this is the scout though. Pink with the unusual creep rot going for the small green camp first. Was able to finish that one in peace. And that does matter. Every point of damage, every right click on the DK here is relevant. Because of course there's a... Uh, no easy way to heal. There is Ritual Dagger, yes, but it doesn't heal that much, and it's not that cheap compared to heal selves, especially. Heal selves for 100 gold, heal... Uh, how much is it? 1,350 HP. And the Ritual Dagger. I'm not exactly sure how much it... How much does it heal again? Ritual Dagger. I think it's like 175? HP per charge, so 350 HP. Which all is to say it's a lot more expensive for the under to heal up early compared to the orc. Linguagua now trying to sneak in the marketplace creep, but perfect timing for Pink. He's got a really good opportunity here to steal his last hit with a coil. And he gets it! Oh, that's a huge move. Item, of course, going to the Farseer's. The one of mana ceiling is really good against the DK. But he's forced to TP out and Linguagua getting punished for his greedy play. It's a pretty obvious move to fall back and then try to creep the middle, so the possibility of a creep jack there is always very real, and that was That was pretty sloppy by Linguagua. This is basically a wasted early game by Guagua. So Pink here in a very good position now after these first couple of minutes. It's far from over though. Um, this can still turn out much better for Linguagua on tier 2. But now having a level 2 DK against level 1 Farseer, that's almost unheard of. That's uh, it's a great situation. Great situation for Pink. Whoops. It's a hard choice now for Guagua to make. Is he just going to continue harassing? Try to slow down the level 3 DK? Or is he just going to creep passively on his side? That's also not ideal. Because he wants to be able to save some creep camps there for his second and third hero. Ooh, and now the punishment continues. Two headhunters going down. And I can already guarantee you, this game, there's going to be no opportunity for a fast, Please. tiny Great Hall. Because now, Linguagua is behind. DK almost level 3 already, that's super fast. The camp still not fully taken, the Dark Ranger could pick up more skeletons from this. Pink looking very confident now, almost with a surround there, takes out the next Headhunter, that's three Headhunters down. Second hero of choice, Shadow Hunter. Normally with Hex you would like to find some kills, but the army is so small and there's so many skellies on the other side. That you can't go for any kills. And this... Oof. <laughs> this is about the worst early game you can imagine for Linguagua. In the normal world, this game should be unwinnable. But let's see if he can find a way back. Oh my god, DK level 3 with full mana. All right, I think, I think it's time, bro. I think it's time to, yeah. Um. 
Ja, GG. Oh boy. Man, oh man. That was a bloody affair. Linguagua, um, with a rough early game. You can't just, you know, spend the first three minutes of the game trying to harass, achieving nothing in the harass, and then falling back to the creep, and then getting forced to TP out, getting no experience, continuing to lose headhunters. Um, yeah, that was just pretty poor movement, to be honest. Um, and that can be a danger when you're playing very aggressively. If you're playing aggressively, and then it turns out to be ineffective, and then you try to fall back, to finally get some creeping done, but then you get punched there as well, then suddenly you're super far behind, so... The safer approach is oftentimes to just creep. In the early days of Headhunters, we especially saw how the Undeads were struggling when the Farseer was pushing and pressuring with the Farseer right away and three, four, five Headhunters, but Undeads nowadays have realized they can just be patient in their main with a narrow tower, you know, try to not lose too much, too much HP. And at some point, the orc has to leave. And with that, Pink gets the equalizer. 1-1, one, one, we're tied up. And a third map is going to bring us the decision. Linguagua, there's still always an option for him to consider a Blade Master, maybe. This is still a very playable style, also one that a lot of Undeads aren't so used to against anymore. But um, I think the difficulty of execution there is perhaps more on the Orc side, because uh, when you scout a Blade Master that you're facing as Undead, you can, I think, adjust easier to that playstyle than it is to completely rewire your game plan from Farsi on to Blade Master. It, really, it plays completely differently. It's an entirely different story. Like normally with a Blade Master, at the very early game on level 1 and 2, you want to harass the DK. So you force a lot of mana, especially out of him, force some resources out of him. You have to be really smart with where you harass, where you creep, what you try to steal, what you try to creep yourself. And then when you fall back on tier 2, you have to play super passive, basically. All the European orcs that use the Shadowhunter with Hex and run across the map with speed scroll, try to find kills. That's not the right way to play it. You have to be very passive in the mid game and have to wait a long time for all your tier three to come online and then finally to take the initiative again. So it's it's a very different style, very, very different from Farsi Headhunter, where you can just kind of uh, freestyle it most of the time. You can go harass, you can go creep, you can play TC second, Shadowhunter second, you can try to expand on tier two, you can try to go into upkeep on tier three, you can try to instant expand, lots of things you can do with Farsi Headhunters. It's a lot more forgiving, I would say, um, than a Blade Master would be. So perhaps that also has to do with why most orcs nowadays seem to really prefer fast the headhunters. And we'll see if Linguagua will choose it a third time. It certainly looks that way. Early war mill, early headhunters confirmed. Not opening with a grunt here, which is kind of normal on AZ. Starting with one grunt into headhunters, because with that you can do the lightning shield creep very easily at the lab, which is very helpful. And pink, by the way, playing a ghoul build this time. DK and ghouls. And you know what? I don't mind that at all. You can creep super well with the ghouls on this map. You can... Do a lightning shield creep right away at the lab, get level 2 instantly, and then go into the middle, creep the kobolds, creep the trolls, for a very quick level 3. And once you're level 3 DK, and you have a couple of ghouls, you can hunt down those headhunters quite well. If you have a decent amount of mana left. I might be able to interrupt this creep a little. Oh, yeah. Nicely done. 
if you trigger the purge on the peon at the exact time that the opponent wants to trigger the lightning shield, uh, it's not gonna occur. Oh, and Linguagua. Gonna come in for the harass right away. Oh, Pink tried to get the last hit with the right click, but he didn't get it. Lingua gets the experience. Oh boy, that's a disaster. Is the DK stuck here? Well, I guess the question is, who's stuck with whom? They may both have to TP out here. <laughs> There's no coil anymore. Is he gonna let him die? No. TP's out. The Fossier also. Oof. Almost dying. There's probably gonna be a TP force on the other side as well. Oh my god, the DK though against the wolves! And the DK dies! Oh my god. And that's level 2 for the Farseer. <sighs> and Pink didn't even start the tech because he was a little overwhelmed. A player's forces are under attack. Oh boy. The mistake here by Pink was still trying to go for the lightning shield despite the fact that the peon was there. He should have just gone in right away. Don't bother with the lightning shield and just right click and coil the renegade. Then he could have killed it before the Farseer arrived. With three ghouls and a DK, you can easily creep this camp even without a lightning shield. But a little mistake. Punished. Super hard. Oh my god, dude. What a punish. Ay, 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 ay. Farseer keeps creeping in the middle. Seems like he's gonna be getting a quick level three at this point. The DK gonna get at least level 2. Alright, I was worried he wasn't gonna get level 2 from this, but he does. A player's forces are under and this attack. is a marvelous game for Linguagua. All three maps so far have been really polarizing. With uh, one player falling behind super far at the very beginning. And again, I come back to my point on map 1. It's really, really important in this matchup to not fall behind. Pink now has his work cut out for him. Then Guagua also, with an interesting decision now to make, he knows he's super far ahead. But sometimes getting ahead is easier than utilizing that lead perfectly. Meaning, it's hard to tell what the perfect thing to do is right now with that lead that he has. He's creeping up the natural. So you may want to try to expand on tier 2 and pressure with a Shadow Hunter second in the meantime. That could be a possibility. Big item here for Guaga. What did he get? Bell of Giant Strength is uh, actually pretty alright. EK will be in the front line, will be taking quite a bit of damage, most likely. Oh, two ghouls go down. One to the creeps, one to the Fossier. And the Headhunters might be on an intercept course here. Shadowhunter is about to come out with Hex. There's more kill potential. DK going for a telestaff. Okay. Don't feel like he needed that to get away, but... Better safe than sorry, I guess. The thing is, against Hex, he's not even safe with that. Whew. And basically all the ghouls go down. That's not enough damage to destroy the bestiary. But the DK is very tanky, so... He should be able to make it away here. Don't think he can get killed with Hex. Oh, he's gonna try though. He's gonna have to land the surround. Not so easy against a hexed target. Oh, I guess it is though. Gets the surround and keeps it closed. Hex coming through again. Oh, he even saves that thunder. I think he should be able to hex again. Oh! And the ledge follow up. Oh boy! <laughs> GG is called. And Linguagua gets the win. That was three stomps in a row, one after the next.
Interesting. I feel like we didn't get to see their full potential in the late game. Both, uh, well, we had sort of a late game situation on map one, but Pink was so far behind, there wasn't much he could do anymore. Um, yeah, okay. First series, a three map series that's over in only 35 minutes. That's pretty unusual. Quite a few short games. We already had quite a few short games yesterday. Um, okay, so we're going to be a bit ahead of schedule here, but I imagine the next game 